Okay, looks like we're good to go. Um, again, thanks everyone for being here. This webinar, uh, really excited to host this webinar today and invite Dr. Sinclair to talk about more, more about his upcoming book. Um, really excited to have a book in this topic uh, being released to the public now. I think it's a really important time in our industry. Uh, so it's really timely, a book launch. Um, just a quick introduction to LEAF, the parent organization that's organizing this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm sure you, a lot of you guys are already aware, but our mission is to promote biomedical technologies that will increase healthy human lifespan. Uh, we do this by crowdfunding research efforts and engaging the public. Um, and through this, we aim to more quickly bring about a future free from age-related disease. If you are so inclined to help us in this mission, we would appreciate you guys uh, becoming Lifespan Heroes. Uh, links are on the web chat on the side if you guys want to contribute to our mission. Um, this um, webinar was ideated because uh, one of the uh, initiatives that we run is Longevity uh, Book Club, which is a um, group that I organize on a monthly basis. We essentially read about 150 pages from a specific uh, longevity-related book uh, per month and then meet to discuss this once a month. Um, the next book that we'll be reading is Dr. Sinclair's book, uh, so I thought it would be good to have him come on board for a webinar and talk a little bit about his book ahead of us uh, reading that through the group. If any of you are interested in joining the book club uh, and participating in a reading over the next three or three months, uh, do let me know. I'll put some information on how you can join uh, the book club on the chat on the side. Um, besides that, um, I think uh, we can go ahead and uh, get started. Um, we'll have a little bit of time for Dr. Sinclair to talk a little bit about his book, and then we'll jump into a little bit of reading from him, uh, a couple of excerpts from his book, and then we'll jump into a um, live Q&A session. Uh, so I think Dr. Sinclair doesn't really need an introduction, but um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Dr. Sinclair, he is a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School and is one of the leading innovators of his generation. He's been named by Times as one of the 100 most influential people in the world and top 50 um, most influential people in healthcare. Um, without further ado, uh, I'll drop it off to Dr. Sinclair uh, to talk a little bit more about his book and uh, take it away. Great. Thanks, Javier. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, it's really great to be able to speak to you all. Uh, about this book um, and about the research that I've been doing uh, for about the last 25 years of my life. Um, I think you all know I'm based at Harvard Medical School, and so that's where I'm talking to you from today. From uh, a standing desk, uh, I've recently uh, gotten one of those. So if you don't have a standing desk, I highly recommend it. Um, so uh, one of the questions Javier wanted me to answer was, why did I write the book? And uh, I think you'll probably know what the book looks like. Uh, it ended up looking like this in the US. If you're calling in from the UK, it'll look slightly different. It'll have lifespan across there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the same stuff in there. Uh, I wrote the book because uh, I get, I, I'm asked the same questions everywhere I go. Uh, and there are a lot of people who over the years have said, you have to write a book because this message of longevity and the science of longevity just isn't reaching the masses. Um, and even worse, the media, when they talk about it, they they spin it the wrong way or they hype it. Um, and so people don't know what to believe. Um, and if anything, they, they've just become quite skeptical. And because I'm in a position now of a, being a, a leader in the field and at, at Harvard and have published in top scientific journals, um, I saw a need for someone like me, uh, it ended up being me, to write down what's actually going on in the field. Um, and it, I have a unique perspective as well. I, I see results in mice and humans sometimes 10 years before you do. Uh, and I have results from my own family's experience. Uh, and I wanted to share all of those, but with a, with a book that takes, takes the reader on a journey, a journey through their own lives, imagining what that could look like, a journey through human history and what that tells us about what kind of a time period we're in right now, a very, very exciting turning point. Uh, and what does the future look like if we're successful or if we're not successful at uh, combating what I am calling in this book, the world's greatest disease. Um, and so I actually started writing the first draft of this book 10 years ago. Um, but the problem was that the field kept jumping ahead so quickly that uh, it needed to get, get rewritten and rewritten. And 
finally, I uh, actually found a co-author who I think is a, a brilliant, uh, if not a genius, but he's um, Matt LaPlante, my co-author, was able to write at a speed and with the quality that, that enabled us to put some of the lab's research on the page as it was being discovered. And so the reader is able to be part of the kind of daily life that I, I'm very blessed to, to lead every day. It's a very exciting one. Um, but ultimately it's part of my life's goal, which is um, through this book, through my research, through my companies, uh, I wanna leave this world a, a much better place than I found it. And if you've read the book or if you're going to read the book, you'll realize that uh, my grandmother had a big influence on me and she lived through World War II and the aftermath and she said to me, David, humans screw everything up, adults are the problem, stay young at heart and do your best to give humanity the best chance of, uh, of making it. And so that, that's what the book is all about. Um, why now? Well, it wasn't by design. It, it, you know, I said it started 10 years ago, but it was very fortuitous because the field has exploded. The science is incredible. The, the future looks very bright and the public's interest is only increasing. Um, how do you, I want to talk a little bit about how to be involved in what I do. There are a number of ways. Um, the first one I would say would be to uh, follow, follow me and what I do and, and keep getting informed. I've started a newsletter. I have um, a book website. The book, of course, has its own social media, which I mostly populate myself. So you're actually directly um, seeing what's on in my head. That's, that's just a starting point. Other ways to get involved would be to send out the word that this is real science, that this is a, a, an area to invest in, um, a career that is uh, an incredible opportunity, um, and really just help me spread this word of what an exciting time we live in and what, what scientists are up to. Um, if you're a scientist, uh, you could get involved in the field. Um, there's a number of labs around the world probably at least 30 really great ones that you could choose from to, to work in. Uh, if you're not a scientist, uh, well, there, there are ways to, um, to promote the cause. You can get involved with lifespan.io, with LEAF. There are plenty of organizations where we need your help. Um, and other than that, you, you're welcome to engage with me. Uh, I'm quite happy to, uh, to talk about what we could do from here on in terms of uh, an engagement with the public, whether it's events or other newsletters to write, or if I can help you, let me know as well, because now I have a platform to do that. Uh, what's particularly exciting um, for me, as I, I mentioned earlier, is to see how well the book is, has been received. Uh, I think you, you can appreciate what it's like spending 10 years doing something and you, you, know, you think for 10 years, is this going to work? Are people going to care? Is anyone even going to like it? Am I going to come in for criticism from my colleagues? Uh, I've been really lucky that what's happened is, um, so far, no criticism from my colleagues. Uh, I was very careful to write a very factual book. Um, and any time I, I gave some evidence, I would put an, another end note in the back. So the book is... Um, is thick in part because it's full of references that you can check out. Uh, the book has done extremely well. You know, I, I don't like boasting. I'm a, a humble person by nature, but uh, I found out today the book is on the top 10 on Amazon. And uh, you know, it's up there with Michelle Obama's book and other stuff like that. And the fact that a science book can do so well, I think it speaks to the fact that there are a lot of us who are still very interested in logical thinking um, and science as an, an area of interest um, and reading is alive and well. Um, yeah, and so, so the book's reception uh, couldn't have been better, but it's probably gonna drop down on the list if we don't keep up the, the effort. And so I'm, I'm not on a book tour, I'm, I'm too busy, I have a day job. Um, and so your help is needed to keep the word up. If you read the book and you love it, um, please post a review, tell your friends, um, tweet about it because that's the only way we'll keep it selling. Um, in terms of selling, it's it's an interesting thing. I'm I'm unlikely to make money off this, but I've also I've pledged um, to be giving um, 
the use use the profits to to fund other efforts, whether it's research, but also there are some really important causes that I am going to currently actually I'm sponsoring in Africa. I just got back from Africa. If, if any of you saw the Joe Rogan podcast, I talk quite a lot about my life changing events in Africa and up to Israel. Um, so I'll pause there. Uh, have you, have you do you want to uh, take it from here or what would you like to do? Yeah, so um, the next portion we were uh, hoping maybe to have you read a couple of excerpts from the book that you thought were particularly interesting. Um, and maybe we can leverage those to start some discussion afterwards. Yeah, the I, I'd love to. So the, and I've never done this before, so forgive me if it's, if it's uh, not as great as you hope. Um, I did record the audio book, uh, so you can download that. And it's a, if you haven't seen the book, it's, I tried to do something better and different than anything that's come before in science writing. And so in the audio book, there's interleaved conversations between my co-author and me in between chapters about what we were thinking and how we wrote the book together. Um, I've, I've had a, a medical illustrator, uh, a brilliant medical illustrator, Catherine Delphia. She spent a year drawing many different um, illustrations for the book and their works of art. Here we have Rapamycin, Metformin, Resveratrol, and Amen. Uh, you know, I think one day we'll have to have an art exhibition. And then finally, uh, there's, a, there's a glossary in the back. If you are not a cell biologist, you can look up the meaning of, of the words. Um, you can see here, it's pretty simple. Uh, and then one thing that I'm somewhat proud of is that I, I have a cast of characters in the back. And so these, these are some of the characters in the book. I don't know how well you can see them, but uh, because of copyright law, I had to draw each of them. Um, each one took me about an hour and I only had 28 days to do it. So I hope you enjoy it all. And I'd love to read a, a few passages for you right now. Now, if I jump to the middle of the book, it might be difficult uh, more difficult to follow. So I've picked out some passages that don't require any pre-reading. And the first part is in the introduction to the book. The introduction, of course, is, is more of a personal story just to set up why is there a book about aging in the first place. And I'm gonna start from the middle of the introduction. Ever since I can remember, I have wanted to understand why we grow old but finding the source of a complex biological process is like searching for the spring at the source of a river. It's not easy. On my quest, I've wound my way left and right and had days when I wanted to give up, but I've persevered. Along the way, I've seen a lot of tributaries, but I've also found what may be the spring. In the coming pages, I will present a new idea about why aging evolved, and how it fits into what I call the information theory of aging. I'll also tell you why I have come to see aging as a disease, the most common disease, one that is not, one that not only can be treated, but should be aggressively treated. That's part one. In part two, I will introduce you to the steps that can be taken right now and new therapies in development that may slow, stop, and even reverse aging, bringing an end to aging as we know it. And yes, I fully recognize the implications of the words bringing an end to aging as we know it. So in part three, I will acknowledge the many possible futures these actions could create and propose a path to a future that we can look forward to, a world in which the way we can get to an increased lifespan is through an ever rising health span, the portion of our lives spent without disease or disability. Now, there are plenty of people who will tell you it's a fairy tale, closer to the work of H.G. Wells than those of C.R. Darwin. And some of them are very smart. A few are even people who understand human biology quite well and whom I respect. Those people will tell you that our modern lifestyles have cursed us with shortening lifespans. They'll say you're unlikely to see 100 years and that your children are unlikely to get to the century mark too. They'll say that they've looked at all the science and done the projections, and it sure doesn't seem likely that your grandchildren will get to their 100th birthdays either. And they'll say that if you do get to 100, you'll probably, you won't get there healthy, and you definitely won't get there for very long. 
And if they grant you that people will live longer, they'll tell you that it's the worst thing for this planet. Humans are the enemy. They've got good evidence for all of this, the entire history of humanity, in fact. Sure, little by little, millennia by millennia, we've been adding years to the average human life, they will say. Most of us didn't get, till, get to 40, and then we did. Most of us didn't get to 50, and then we did. Most of us didn't get to 60, and then we did. By and large, these increases in life expectancy came as more of us gained access to stable food sources and clean water. And largely, the average was pushed upwards from the bottom. Deaths during infancy and childhood fell, and life expectancy rose. This is the simple math of human mortality. But although the average kept moving up, the limit did not. As long as we've been recording history, we have known of people who have reached their 100th year and who might have lived a few years beyond that mark. But very few reach 110, and almost no one reaches 115. Our planet has been home to more than 100 billion humans so far, and we know of just one, Jeanne Calmen of France, who ostensibly lived past the age of 120. Most scientists believe she died in 1997 at the age of 122, although it's possible that her daughter replaced her to avoid paying taxes. Whether or not she actually made it to that age really doesn't matter. Others have come within a few years of that age, but most of us, 99.9% .9 of us to be precise, are dead before 100. So it certainly makes sense when people say that we might continue to chip away at the average, but we're not likely to move the limit. They say it's easier to extend the maximum lifespan of mice or of dogs, but we humans are different. We simply live too long already. They are wrong. There's also a difference between extending life and prolonging vitality. We're capable of both, but simply keeping people alive, decades after their lives have become defined by pain, disease, frailty, and immobility, is no virtue. Prolonged vitality, meaning not just more years of life, but more active, healthy, and happy ones, is coming. And it's coming sooner than most people expect. By the time the children who are born today have reached middle age, John Calment may not even be on the list of top 100 oldest people of all time. And by the turn of the next century, a person who is 122 on the day of his or her death may be said to have lived a full, though not a particularly long life. 120 years might not be an outlier, but an ex expectation. So much so that we won't even call it longevity. We'll just simply call it life. And we'll look back at, with sadness on a time in our history in which it was not so. So what is the upward limit? I don't think there is one. Many of my colleagues agree. There is no biological law that says we must age. And those who say there is, they don't know what they're talking about. We're probably still a long way off from a world in which death is a rarity, but we're not far from pushing it even farther into the future. All of this is in fact inevitable. Prolonged healthy lifespans are in sight. Yes, the entire history of humanity suggests otherwise, but the science of lifespan extension in this particular century says that the previous dead ends are poor guides. It takes radical thinking to even begin to approach what this will mean for our species. Nothing in our billions of years of evolution has prepared us for this, which is why it's so easy, even alluring, to say that it just simply cannot be done. But that's what people thought about human flight up until the moment that a couple of people did it. So today the Wright brothers are back in their workshop, having successfully flown their gliders down the sand dunes of Kitty Hawk. The world is about to change. And just as was the case in the days leading up to December 17, 1903, the majority of humanity is oblivious. There was simply no context with which to construct the idea of controlled powered flight back then. So the idea was fanciful, magical, the stuff of speculative fiction, then lift off, and nothing was ever the same. We are at another point of historical inflection. What hitherto seemed magical will become real. It is a time in which humanity will redefine what is possible, a time of ending the inevitable. Indeed, it is a time in which we will redefine what it means to be human. For this is not just the start of a revolution, it is the start of an evolution. End of introduction. So hopefully I've got your attention. Um, what's 
interesting in the book is it's not just the, the current stuff that's published, but there's work in my lab that is going to be published that's actually already in the book. We'll see what the uh, editors think about that. But uh, we've got breakthroughs, we think, in reprogramming cells to actually reverse the clock of aging. So let's see, I have maybe a couple of quick passages to read. Is that okay, Javier? Yeah, it sounds good. All right, let's see. All right, so the, this is the first chapter. Now, we get more into the meat as we go on, but I, I didn't want to jump into the meat other, lest I, I, I lose you a little bit. But this is the start of chapter one. And you'll get an idea of how I, I think about aging. It's called Viva Primordium, chapter one. Imagine a planet about the size of our own, about as far from its star, rotating about its axis a bit faster, such that a day lasts about 20 hours. It is covered with a shallow ocean of salty water and it has no continents to speak of, just some sporadic chains of, of basaltic black islands peeking up above the waterline. Its atmosphere does not have the same mix of gases as our own. It is a humid, toxic blanket of nitrogen, methane and carbon dioxide. There is no oxygen, there is no life. Because this planet, our planet as it was four billion years ago, is a ruthlessly unforgiving place, hot and volcanic, electric, tumultuous. But that is about to change. Water is pooling next to warm thermal vents that litter one of the islands. Organic molecules cover all the surfaces, having ridden in on the backs of meteorites and comets. But sitting on dry volcanic rock, these molecules will remain just molecules. But when dissolved in pools of warm water, through cycles of wetting and drying at the pool's edges, a special chemistry takes place. As the nucleic acids concentrate, they grow into polymers, the way salt crystals form when a seaside puddle evaporates. These are the world's first RNA molecules, the predecessors to DNA. When the pond refills, the primitive genetic material becomes encapsulated by fatty acids to form microscopic soap bubbles, the first cell membranes. It doesn't take long, a week perhaps, before the shallow ponds are covered with a yellow froth of trillions of tiny precursor cells filled with short strands of nucleic acids, which today we would call genes. Most of the proto cells are recycled, but some survive and begin to evolve primitive metabolic pathways until finally the RNA begins to copy itself. That point marks the origin of life. Now that life has formed, as fatty acid soap bubbles filled with genetic material, they begin to compete for dominance. There sim simply are not enough resources to go around. May the best scum win. Day in, day out, the microscopic fragile life forms begin to evolve into more advanced forms, spreading into rivers and lakes. Okay, I'm gonna skip a little bit because I wanna get to... Uh... So there's a new life form that now has evolved, a genetic circuit that allows it to survive. We call it M superstices, and it's super primed for survival. So now we jump forward in time. Now comes another assault on life. Powerful cosmic rays from a distant solar eruption are bathing the earth, shredding the DNA of all the microbes in the dying lakes. The vast majority of them carrying on, they carry on dividing as if nothing has happened, unaware that their genomes have been broken and that reproducing will kill them. Unequal amounts of DNA are shared between mother and daughter cells, causing both to malfunction. Ultimately, the endeavor is hopeless. The cells all die and nothing is left. Nothing that is, but magna superstes, our new life form. For as the rays wreak their havoc, M superstes does, not, does something unusual. Thanks to the movement of protein away from gene A to help repair the DNA breaks, it switches on and the cells stop almost everything else they're doing, turning their limited energy towards fixing the DNA that has been broken. By virtue of its defiance of the ancient imperative to reproduce, M. superstes has survived. When the latest dry periods end and the lakes refill, M. superstes it wakes up. Now it can reproduce. Again and again it does so, multiplying, moving into new biomes, evolving, creating generations upon generations of new descendants. They are our Adam and Eve. 
Okay, I'll just read a little bit more. I think it's interesting. Like Adam and Eve, we don't know if M. superstes ever existed, but my research over the past 25 years suggests that every living thing we see around us today is a product of this great survivor, or at least a primitive organism very much like it. The fossil record in our genes goes a long way to proving that every living thing that shares this planet with us still carries this ancient genetic survival circuit in more or less the basic form. It is there in every plant, it is there in every fungus, it's there in every animal, and it's there in us. I propose that the reason this gene circuit is conserved is that it is a rather simple and elegant solution to the challenges of a sometimes brutish, sometimes bounteous world that better ensures the survival of the organisms that carry it. Jumping forward a little bit. The human body, though far from perfect and still evolving, carries an advanced version of this survival circuit that allows it to last many decades past reproduction. And while it's interesting to speculate why lifespans first evolved, it's really quite amazing that chaos, the chaos that exists at the molecular scale, it's surprising we live more than 30 seconds. Of course, I'm paraphrasing here. But we do survive, marvelously we do, miraculously we do, for we are the progeny of a very long lineage of great survivors. Ergo, we are great survivors. But there is a trade-off. For this circuit, this survival circuit within us, the descendants of a series of mutations in our most distant ancestors is also the reason we age. And yes, that definitive singular article is correct. It is the reason. And I go on to explain a new theory for aging as to why um, we age in the first place. It comes down to aging be a, being a loss of information, not the digital genomic information, but the analog information in our cells, the epigenome. Um, I'm gonna skip through what I think is a beautifully written uh, section called Fruit of the Same Tree on page 53. You know what, I'll, I'll read you the first two paragraphs and then jump to what I, I'm gonna finish with. So it's in the chapter called The Demented Pianist, Fruit of the Same Tree. Like the gnarled hands of giant zombies breaking free of the rocky soil, the ancient bristlecone pine trees of California's White Mountains strike haunting silhouettes against the dewy morning sun. The oldest of these trees have been here since before the pyramids of Egypt were built, before the construction of Stonehenge, and before the last of the woolly mammoths left our world. They have shared this planet with Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and the first Buddha. Standing some two miles above sea level, adding fractions of a millimeter of growth to their twisted trunks each year, defying lightning storms and periodic droughts, they are the epitome of perseverance. It's easy to stand in wonder of these great and ancient things. It's easy to be swept away by their might and majesty. It's easy to simply stare at them in awe. But there's another way to view these antediluvian patriarchs, a harder way, but a way in which we should seek to view every living thing on this planet as our, as our teachers. Bristle cones are after all our cousins, about half of their genes are close relatives of ours, yet they do not age. All right. Okay, and then I'll finally end on page 81. It's called, uh, page 80, it's called uh, The Blind Epidemic. Aging results in physical decline. It limits the quality of life, and it has a specific pathology. Aging does all this, and in doing so, it fulfills every category of what we, what we call a disease, except one. It impacts more than half the population. According to the Merck Manual of Geriatrics, a malady that impacts less than half the population is a disease. But aging, of course, impacts everybody. The manual therefore calls aging, quote, inevitable, irreversible decline in organ function that occurs over time even in the absence of injury, illness, environmental risks, or poor lifestyle choices. Can you imagine saying that cancer is inevitable or irreversible or diabetes or gangrene? I can, because we used to say that. All of these may be natural problems, but that doesn't make them inevitable and irreversible, and it sure doesn't make them acceptable. The manual is wrong about aging. But being wrong has never stopped conventional, conventional wisdom 
from negatively impacting public policy. And because aging isn't a disease by the commonly accepted definition, it doesn't fit nicely into the system we've built for funding medical research or drug development and the reimbursement of medical costs by insurance companies. But words matter, definitions matter, framing matters, and the words, definitions, and framing we use to describe aging are all about inevitability. We didn't just throw in the towel before the fight began. We threw it in before we even knew there was, was a fight to be had. But there is a fight, a glorious and global one, and I think a winnable one. There's no good reason why we have to say that something that happens to 49.9% of the population is a disease, while something that happens to 50.1% of the population is not. In fact, that's a backward way of approaching problems that lends itself to the whack-a-mole system of medicine we've set up in hospitals and research centers around the world. Why would we choose to focus on problems that impact small groups of people if we could also address the problem that impacts everyone, especially if in doing so, we could significantly impact all those other problems? We can. I believe that aging is a disease. I believe it is treatable. I believe we can treat it within our lifetimes. And in doing so, I believe everything we know about human health will, will be fundamentally changed. And the rest is in here. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Sinclair. Um, I think um, that'll spur some interesting discussion. Um, how about we jump to the Q&A now? Um, the next portion of this webinar will be fielding some questions from the audience. We'll have both some queued up uh, written questions via the chat and then some live questions that we'll call on some people that raise their hand via the chat feature. Uh, for that, we'll hand it over to Steve and Josh will be monitoring the Q&A. Uh, Steve, do you wanna take it away and start uh, calling out people for the Q&A portion of this? Okay, uh, for everybody who's joined us a bit later, at the bottom you'll see uh, there is uh, an option to raise hand uh, if you'd like to come on the mic and um, ask a question directly that's how you do it and we'll, we'll call you out um, in due course we're going to go through uh, some of the questions and boy we've had a lot we've had a lot so Josh is going to go through them with me I'm just scrolling all the way back up it's uh, it's astounding uh, how many we've had uh, okay well, I'll start with the very first one that we had. Um, Frederick R. has asked, um, Dear Professor Sinclair, since there is a circadian component to NAD synthesis in humans, do you think that there may be a benefit to splitting the dose of NMN or NR into a morning and evening dose? Or is there a reason to believe that an evening dose may disturb sleep? Uh, great question. Now, in mice, it's very clear that uh, NAD will cycle throughout the day, and it will also go up when we're hungry um, and when we're, when we're ready for the day in the morning. Now, from my own experience, if I take uh, a dose of NMN at night, I don't sleep well. Um, and I know this with, uh, it's an N of one experiment, but, but at least it's, it's, uh, it's actual data from this aura ring that I, I wear. And so I, I, I think that based on the mouse studies of mostly of, of Shin MI, who's done a lot of work on the clock, that it's probably true for us that we don't wanna be um, counteracting our NAD levels with the natural cycle. And so I take my NMN in the morning to give me a boost. And I, I think it, it helps, it feels like a cup of coffee to me. Um, that said, if I'm, if I'm jet lagged, I will take an, an NMN um, dose when I land in the morning um, and in the expectations or at least the, the hope that that will help me get over my jet lag as well. Great, hopefully that, uh, that was uh, what you were looking for. Thanks for that. Um, okay, let's see what else we've got. Ah. Dear Professor Sinclair, I understand that you are friends with the excellent Professor Walter Longo, who's also on our scientific advisory board, as is David. During fasting, NAD increases in several tissues, 
if you did a combination experiment with a fasting um, mimetic diet, uh, FMD, plus NMN versus just FMD, would you dose the NMN during the fasting period or during the refeeding period and why? That's a good question. That's a really good question. And yeah, it, it's such a good question. Um, the answer is uh, we, we should be doing that experiment. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to run experiments in rodents to test that. Um, so what I'm gonna say is speculation um, based on having read thousands of papers. Um, I, I think that uh, I would use NMN to, uh, to boost uh, the fasting signal. I think that keeping high levels of, N of NAD constant may not be the, the way to go. I think the body needs, needs to be cycling and resting. Um, I think probably ideally you want, if your cycles are like this, you want to keep them like this. Um, so yeah, you know, I don't know for sure, but we did do an experiment that's interesting and relevant, which was to feed mice resveratrol um, in the context of intermittent fasting. And this is data that most people have not realized is in the paper because the title said that resveratrol didn't extend lifespan, but it actually did. Um, and it, it, resveratrol worked in a, com in a combination with um, intermittent fasting. And those mice were the longest lived of all the groups, that combination. Um, resveratrol, just to remind you, uh, activates CERT1, um, and CERT1 is one of the, the enzymes that NAD will, will also boost. I think of resveratrol as the accelerator pedal for CERT1 and NAD as the gas. Um, and that's why I continue to, to take both each, each day. Um, but yeah, I think to summarize, uh, using it to augment uh, fasting would be good. Um, but I don't, I literally don't know, um, and it's even hard to guess whether it's better to take it uh, while you're hungry or with your food. You know, if, if we go based on those mouse resveratrol experiments, you would say have it with food, which is what I currently do, uh, and don't take it while you're, you're fasting. Um, but we, you know, the field, Volta Longo and I were in Israel recently, and one of the big questions that came up in our symposium was exactly that. We don't know when to take molecules, and we don't know what combinations to take either. And that's the cutting edge of the field that, um, that we need to, to move as fast as possible uh, so we have answers to these kind of excellent questions. Okay, our next question is from Tashi Herzmark. Dr. Sinclair, would you care to comment on the recent publication of RHGH, DHEA, and metformin that have been reported to affect a 2.5 year reduction in epigenetic measure of biological age? Yes, I, I get asked that every hour now. Um, so Steve Horvath um, and Greg Fahey, uh, I know both of them, they're, they're rigorous scientists. Um, the study is intriguing. I would, I would give it that. I would say it's an early sign that it might help. Um, the, so that's the positive side. Um, Steve's a very good mathematician and his algorithms don't lie. Um, if he tells me it's statistically significant, um, I believe it. Um, he's a mathematician more than a biologist. Now that said, 2.5 years is not a lot of time. Um, it was even 1.5 actually, uh, reversal. And, and the other problem with the study, which the authors will freely admit, is that it was only nine people. Now that said, the, 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 the thymus looked like it was denser and had less fat in it. So that was encouraging to say the least. Um, but like most scientists, and, and it's very true in this case, uh, we need to do more, they need to do more patients. Um, their, their problem is that it costs $10,000 to run each person's um, samples. So it's not easy to do 100, but I think we need, I, th I would say we need at least 25, hopefully 50 people uh, to be able to say that that clock was really reversed. Um, and even if it went back 2.5 years and we believe that that's true, um, it's not a lot. And with the reprogramming work that we've recently posted on BioArchive, um, and is in the book and is under review at Nature, um, we think that we can reverse it much more than that. Um, in the mice, we go back about a year in time. 
And uh, so that's a significant percentage of lifespan. Okay, well, um, we have a couple of people raising their hands in this chat right now. Mike, is your microphone working? Hear me? Ma Mike? Can you, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. You can. Okay, uh, good. First off, Dr. Sinclair, uh, congratulations on the success of your book. Uh, secondly, um, uh, this, I have a couple. One, one you were talking about resveratrol. Uh, do you think uh, terostal bean is just as good as res resveratrol? Mm. And the second question, sorry, um, there's a new company called Machido that just opened up in the UK, uh, and they uh, are offering a, a, a drug uh, or going to be putting out a, a drug uh, that uh, will increase the NAD. Um, reserves of the body. Uh, have, do you know anything about that? Do you think it would work? And along the same lines, what do you think about TA65 to increase uh, telomere uh, uh, length? I'll leave you to that, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm trying to learn about M M Machado, I think you said, uh, Machido. Machido. Uh, no, I, I unfortunately haven't heard about them yet. Um, but uh, I'd be happy to, to read up about it and then post my opinions either on my newsletter or, or uh, on social media. Uh, but yeah, you asked about um, terostilbene instead of resveratrol. Um, I, I think they, they both are likely to, to activate CERT1. Um, in vitro, they do. Uh, we know more about resveratrol, of course. Um, we've done and others have done human clinical trials. There was just a brand new study about two weeks ago that showed that it lowers blood sugar the way we showed in mice in 2003, sorry, 2006. Um, whether or not it's better, I can't say. I haven't put them head to head. I'm unaware of anybody who has. Um, the biggest issue with both molecules is their solubility. And you really, in, in mice and humans, you want to be ingesting the molecule with something that dissolves it, an oil, or I use a yogurt, a spoonful of yogurt in the morning. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess the best answer I could give you that's based on fact is uh, resveratrol has a lot of positive data. Does that mean terostilbene is, is, uh, is worthwhile? I would say probably, but I haven't seen a lot of human studies with terostilbene yet. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm still waiting for more data on terostilbene. And in the meantime, um, because resveratrol has been good to me and good to my lab and the results are so good, uh, I've seen no reason to switch uh, at this point. Okay, um, we have another hand raiser. Uh, R. Salakin, would you please ask your question? Uh, hello? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, Dr. Sinclair, uh, congratulations on your success of the book. Uh, well, I'm an undergrad student from Bangladesh, and uh, I'm more interested in the linkage between uh, sexual dimorphism in higher organisms and the biological aging mechanism. And I would like to know your insight. I know it's a bit off topic, but uh, when I was hearing your introduction, I saw a flow you were going with the origin of life and how um, aging came into that whole mechanism. So I would like to know your insight on uh, the linkage between sexual dimorphism and aging, if uh, you think there is something there to look into. Uh, that is all. Thank you again. Right, right. Um, but so be before I talk about that, uh, I didn't answer the question about TA65, and the, the short answer is um, telomeres are, are part of the hallmarks of aging. Uh, they seem to limit some organs function. Not, it's not the entire answer. There are eight or nine hallmarks of aging. What you'll find in my book is my explanation for how, they, how all the hallmarks fit into one universal theory of aging, and that how we may be able to address all of them with a, with a single treatment. Um, in terms of products, I, I never talk about products specifically. I'm a professor. I don't analyze products, and I certainly don't like it when people use my name to sell products. 
Um, but yeah, TA65 seems like a pure product. Anyone who takes a supplement, I would look for reputation. I would look for good manufacturing um, uh, practices, GMP. Uh, but other than that, I think that these telomerase activators uh, seem to be safe. I haven't seen any, any proof or strong evidence that they cause cancer. That was my biggest worry previously. Um, there are some alternatives to TA65, which you can also find on the internet. Um, I don't take them currently. Um, I am monitoring myself and I seem to be doing fine without them so far. Um, getting to the sex dimorphism, super interesting. I don't know if uh, you were prompted by a, I, I think I, I did a, an Instagram post. My daughter brought home one of the largest spiders in the world. It's gonna grow to 15 inches in diameter, but it, it's a male, it will only live four years and the female can live 15 to 20 years. It's really, so this fits into my th uh, information theory of aging, which is that the epigenome is the major determinant of our longevity and why whales live longer than we live and why we live longer than spiders. And uh, you wanna keep your epigenome stable. And the reason for most of the sexual dimorphism in species uh, is actually epigenetics rather than the sex chromosomes. The sex chromosomes control the epigenome. And so it's very clear to me and many of my colleagues that the, the reason uh, for sexual dimorphism um, could lead to breakthroughs in understanding why, why we age and also how to slow it down. And if we could, find out why the male uh, bird-eating spider uh, only lives four years as a male and then tweak it and make it live 20 years like a female, you know, that would be a huge achievement. And I think that the key is to look at why those females have a more stable epigenome. And it may be related, as you'll see in my book, to um, the ability of the epigenome to unpack itself, repair DNA, and repackage itself so that the cells in the in that spider that female do not lose their identity or become senescent um, in such short time this is a great question and very little understood and even less studied and i think that uh, it's an area that if we had more research uh, dollars it would be an area that i would love to get into um, and and probably many others in the field shelly berger is the one to look up on pubmed she studied uh, i think it was ants um, and the dimorphism there as it relates to aging and the epigenome. Thank you so much. Great, and I should now have proper audio, hopefully. I've been tinkering off camera to try and fix it. So we have, um, we have a, an interesting question. Is there any medical reason an elderly person should not take some form of NAD, NR, NMN? supplement any medical reason that we can think of well yes um, for everybody uh, be careful because we, we haven't done long-term human trials with NAD boosters I think uh, I know more than most people having seen the results of two years of clinical trials that aren't yet published but will be hopefully um, so at any age be careful one of the things that we discovered in my lab was that NMN in mice boosts uh, blood flow and forms new capillaries in muscle. And so those mice, the benefit was they could run 50% further. Uh, and by the way, it was in, in the youth, those mice, when they exercised, there was a, a double benefit in combination with NMN, which was um, an, a surprising result. Gets to the earlier question. But to, to answer your question about aging the aged, if, if you're an older person and you have a tumor already, or you're highly likely to have one, it's feasible that NAD boosters will give more blood flow to the tumor. Now, we haven't any evidence of that. Um, we've given NMN to mice with a couple of different types of tumors, and we don't see any, anything bad happen, no, no accelerated growth of tumors. Uh, in fact, in one case, we saw a, a, a reversal of the tumor or slowing down of tumor size. Uh, but I think that's still a risk. There's one paper from Washington University in St. Louis that uh, deleted an NAD synthetic enzyme called NAMPT uh, and found that it, it prevented uh, brain cancer. But unfortunately, unfortunately the, the publicity people at WashU 
put out a headline that NAD causes brain cancer, which is totally misinterpreting the paper. But I did want to put that out there if you've seen that paper. Um, I don't think that that's a concern, but we should always be nervous or um, cognizant that when we put molecules into our body, we're always taking a risk, even if it's a low one. All right, we're going to call on another uh, hand raiser. Joey, you are up. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you to um, Dr. David Sinclair. I think you're working on the most important uh, problem that exists. And I'm wondering how big you think the chances are of reaching longevity escape velocity in 50 years. And if you think it is possible in that time frame, how the road, um, uh, roadmap towards that would uh, look like. Mm -hmm. Right, so I, in the beginning of, of part three of, of my book, I talk about what does the future look like? Let's do a little math and add up theoretically what could happen over the next 50 to 100 years. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I wouldn't call myself a, an immortalist, uh, mainly because I'm, I'm so busy every day trying to just get, get things practically done. Um, but I do, I do dream a bit in the book about what, what I think will unfold over the coming years. Um, what's, what so I, I changed my view during the writing of the book. And that's because there was a big discovery in my lab. Um, as I mentioned, we're still, um, this paper is under review, but you can see it on the bioarchive.com website. We've been able to reprogram uh, a mouse's eye and save it from blindness to um, treat glaucoma and actually dramatically reverse the, the epigenetic clock, the so-called Horvath clock, and restore youth. Until that data came in, even with rapamycin and other molecules that we work on, metformin, enamin, that there was no way we were going to make it uh, to 120 on average. It's already extremely difficult to extend human average lifespan and maximum by just a couple of years. Uh, we're doing it slowly, but it, but it's what we need is a a quantum leap in uh, in our understanding and abilities, and that's what I think we've had. Um, and I've seen a lot in my career. And uh, Wan Cheng Lu is the student who made the breakthrough in my lab. Collaborators include um, uh, Ji Gang He and Bruce um, Cassandra here at Harvard. And uh, that changed my view. Do I know if we're going to hit escape velocity? I can't say, um, and I, I, I won't say, but I, I do project um, increasing lifespans and perhaps dramatic ones if we're able to get these new uh, reprogramming uh, therapies to work in people. And I hope to start the first safety trial with that technology in about two years. Um, I'm working with Juan Carlos Belmonte from the Salk Institute, who's a probably will win a Nobel Prize for this. Um, Stephen Horvath, who developed the clock, and myself, uh, and a fourth person, uh, Manuel Serrano, who also works on this and discovered P16, the senescence-inducing uh, gene. Um, so that's the update. Uh, hopefully that gives you enough uh, background and uh, entices you to read up uh, about it more. Given the lack of time, I'd better take another question. Great. Okay. And I think we'll call upon uh, David Wood, who is a good friend of ours. So you're up there, David. Go ahead. So thanks, uh, Professor Sinclair, for a really impressive book, which I'm a third of the way through and loving every chapter so far. My question is, how confident are you that a single type of intervention this uh, epigenetic reprogramming will be sufficient to deal with all the downstream hallmarks of aging. Mm. And this is kind of opposed to other approaches to rejuvenation, which seem to suggest that multiple separate interventions will be necessary on a regular basis. Mm. Um, right. Well, I'm not, not certain that reprogramming is the only thing we need. We're going to need senolytics, um, perhaps some telomerase activators, that there are a lot of other things that, that could help get us beyond uh, you know, 120 maximum. Uh, that said, that this reprogramming discovery is so fundamental. It's, 
it's as though we've, we've discovered something that we weren't even expecting. It truly will be a paradigm shift. What we've published, um, and I wrote in the book, is that we, Horvath found the clock. So imagine we have a clock on the wall and we, um, we think that the clock just is an indicator of time. What our new results suggest is that that clock is actually controlling time. And when we move the hands backwards, we actually get, get to rewind back youth and that we have a backup copy of our epigenome that we can access using uh, Yamanaka factors, which you'll, you'll read about um, probably in, in another few pages. Um, why is that important? Well, when we've treated mice, we, we see all of the hallmarks of aging go backwards um, and forwards, by the way. We can also epigenetically age mice and we, we give them aging. And so it's possible that, and what I propose in my book and in, in things that I'm writing now, is that this epigenetic theory, this information theory of aging can explain all of the hallmarks. And if that's true, then by addressing uh, the epigenome, these other hallmarks may by and large go away. And that's what we're actually seeing in mice now by restoring vision in old mice. And if, if we can restore vision in old mice, it's, it's exciting to think what else we might be able to reprogram. But I, I don't know if it's perfect, it's early days. And I still think it's worth pushing ahead very hard with these other approaches addressing the hallmarks individually as well. Okay, we have another question from Frederick. Um, you had mentioned a difference in endurance between mice on NMN that you didn't see in mice on NR. Do you have any speculations as to why? Is NMN targeting muscle innervation or capillarization with greater efficacy than NR? Uh, sure. So that's a minefield because we scientists have our pet molecules and we get very upset. Um, but the, the, the data is the data. Um, it was done actually by an independent group down at UNSW in Sydney. And uh, we don't know why. In fact, it was a surprise that they didn't work equivalently. And I can only speculate why. I, I don't know. I don't think it's because NR uh, got wet or went bad. That can happen if it's exposed to moisture more than N NMN. And I, I really don't, don't understand why it didn't work. Um, it's hard, as you can probably appreciate, figuring that that out. Um, I mean, maybe that if we had a slightly larger dose of NR, it would have worked just as well. I think that's likely, given Johan Ulrichs, Ulrichs in Switzerland has shown that NR can induce uh, endurance. But at least at the same dose in that set of experiments, uh, they were not equivalent. Um, but uh, I don't want to be dragged into the NAD booster wars. I, I really don't have any skin in the game, I'm not selling anything like other scientists are. Yes, the dreaded precursor wars. That would make a good uh, topic, uh, a title for a science fiction uh, book, I think, David, perhaps. Yeah. The precursor wars, you can just see it now. Right, okay, let's take another audience question. Um, Okay, I see Mark Sackler's got his hand uh, raised. Uh, would you like to go ahead, Mark? Yes, can you hear me okay? Yeah, no problem. Okay, great, thank you. So, um, first of all, Dr. Sinclair, thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to reading the book, and I have to shout out and say hi to David Wood, who I know. Um, I am a futurist. Uh, I podcast and blog about the future. Uh, David, Aubrey de Grey, Keith Camito, Steve Horvath have all been on the podcast. But for me as a, pod as a futurist, my main concern are the implications if we get there. And I'm glad to hear that you've got a, uh, a chapter on uh, some scenarios. And I'm curious, it seems to me that the biggest, one of the biggest arguments that what Aubrey de Grey calls the pro-aging trance, one of the biggest arguments out there in, in support of that is that, the, that we're going to be over, overpopulated and lack resources. So I wonder if you have addressed that, and uh, I'm sure you may be a, a familiar with David Wood's latest book, which, which uh, 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 Sustainable Superabundance, which uh, addresses the resources, but also there's a book by a couple of Canadian authors uh, whose names escape me called 
empty planet who actually argue against the overpopulation uh, arguments quite vigorously. So uh, to what extent have you looked into that and uh, have you addressed questions? I, I have actually. Uh, it's one of the biggest questions uh, that I face. Um, so it's, it was very important for me to, I spent many months researching this, uh, both on the population side and the sustainability. And uh, similar to David, um, I, I think these problems are, are overblown. And in the book, I make the case that, first of all, just pure math, if you do, do the numbers, we're not going to be overpopulated. That's, uh, that's irrational. Um, but even if you grant, grant me that we're going to have an extra 500 million to a billion people on the planet, uh, which I don't think is going to happen, we're going to balance out by 2070. Um, and the UN agrees we'll, we'll level out at about 11 billion. But even if you grant me that there'll be more people, there are two, two important things to remember. One is that the savings that will be generated globally are in the many hundreds of billions of dollars per year, not wasting it on spoon feeding the elderly and uh, you know, wheeling them around. Meanwhile, these are productive people in society. So that's a, that's a huge shift in the amount of money that we can put towards solving other problems saving species, uh, engineering our way out of um, the effects of global warming, for example, and feeding the world. By the way, we, we throw out half of our food in this country anyway. So anyone who says that food is an issue doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, and I've just come back from Israel where they're growing food in the middle of the desert and recycling all of their, their water there. Um, so these are all really solvable. In fact, they're already solved in Israel, for example. Um, and then the second is that, um, the, the, um, so we save money, but then also we already have technologies that will allow us to le live with less impact. It's all about consumption. It's not really about the number of people. And I talk a lot about what is the carrying capacity of the earth. And some estimates are that we're already all screwed and others say we can have a hundred billion people. And I think the truth is somewhere in between. And I go through the various reasons why I say that. Um, but I'm very, I'm very bullish on this, that if we don't do anything about the aging population, we're going to continue to spend more and more on healthcare. And that's wasted money, in my view, when we could be solving these other big problems. And I make the case in my book that the best way to solve the future's problems is to work on aging. Can I just make a comment, by the way, that the book Empty Planet uh, says the UN's wrong, that population will peak at 9 billion in 2050 and actually start to decline, in which case we're going to need longer lifespan to keep the, the planet populated. And they, they, they talk to demographers all over the world. It's very well, low. Research. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, look at, look at Germany, Japan. Um, we're already in great need of, of keeping people healthy and, and a population vibrant. The average farmer in Japan is 65 years old. Um, and so that we're already in, in need of this solution. It's not the problem. It's, it's our way out of the problems we've already generated. Our next question is going to come from Anash Gomez. Anash Gomez, you are up. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Yeah, um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, firstly, congratulations, uh, Dr. Sinclair. I'm really looking forward to your book. Um, I guess my question is, uh, um, may, I mean, maybe a little off topic, but um, <clears throat> what, what are your thoughts on Dr. Uh, Gregory um, Fay? He, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, his work on cryopreservation and that being an alternative an alternative um, in case, you know, we don't achieve the longevity escape velocity um, in time as we're all hoping. So any thoughts on the cryopreservation um, techniques and how it's progressing? I don't know if you've covered that in your book, but just wanted, your, wanted to hear your thoughts. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Well, that, that's the ultimate bet that we'll be able to revive ourselves um, if uh, we're able to preserve ourselves with cryotherapy. So the, the, the way it's currently done um, is fairly brutal. Uh, it's a freezing process um, that does a fair bit of damage. 
two cells. So I think that that's, it's going to be a real challenge to bring us back. That said, I can see new developments, particularly with the use of hydrogen sulfide, which uh, we've recently published is, is part of the longevity pathway, uh, coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally. Um, but yeah, I think these advances will allow us to, to be able to be revived from cold storage without even freezing, perhaps, you know, go, go under for a few decades or maybe longer. Uh, we need to figure that out if we're going to make it to another, another habitable uh, solar system anyway, in my view, which uh, I write in the book will take us about 10,000 years to get to unless we have a major breakthrough in, uh, in rocket propulsion. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't think a lot about cryopreservation because it's the, the ultimate um, way to, uh, to, to be alive uh, in the future. My hope is that we don't have to get there. And uh, we can, we don't have to freeze ourselves to be able to preserve what we've got. Um, just while I'm on the topic, our, our bodies are, are open systems, meaning that the entropy that occurs and the loss of epigenetic information, that should be reversible as long as there's a backup copy. We can take in energy as long as there's some energy in the universe. And there's plenty of energy in the universe for the foreseeable future. Um, and so the, the idea that uh, aging is is predisposed and we, can, we can't fight it, uh, just defies biology, it just defies physics. It's great, yeah, great answers. Okay, got a few more questions. Um, I see uh, Brianna has uh, raised her hand. Uh, would you like to go ahead? Yes, thank you. Um, hi there, David. I currently have your audio book and I've been working my way through it and I'm really enjoying it so far. And I joined the conversation a bit late, so my apologies if you've already addressed this. But one question I have is the role you think um, the US government in particular could play in sort of expediting this process where we can get these potential treatments to the public. I know you've discussed this in the past in regards to sort of the semantics around um, designating aging as a disease. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, and perhaps that's the most important thing in regards to moving uh, treatments through the FDA, what do you think the US federal government could do to support the scientific community and the various entrepreneurs there who have these potential treatments? Yeah, right. Well, the, the easy maybe not the easiest, but the, but the simplest would be to declare aging a disease, but that's many years away. So the FDA is open to it, as is the UK, Singapore, Israel, and Australia. Uh, absent that, uh, so th the last part of my book, there's a few pages on this about the current situation of funding for aging research and why we're at this point and what could be done if we're gonna make this future a reality. Right now, aging research gets about uh, a couple of percent of the federal budget. But if you dig down into that number, uh, almost all of it, 99% of it goes to particular diseases, mostly to Alzheimer's disease. And while I, I, I have nothing against Alzheimer's disease research, of course, it's important, but uh, I quote Leonard Hayflick, the uh, discoverer of the Hayflick limit of cell division. And he said the National Institute on Aging should be called the National Institute on Alzheimer's Disease because only a fraction of a percent of that money goes to understanding the fundamental biology of aging. And he says that understanding how to cure Alzheimer's disease will add perhaps 17 days to lifespan. Um, and so he thinks that there should be a reallocation of funds or at least more money put into understanding why we age and how to combat that process. And in doing so, it won't just be able to impact Alzheimer's disease, but cancer, heart disease, and diabetes, and many other things that aging actually causes, even though we're, we're in denial that aging is the major cause of these diseases. Okay, um, what, Dr. Sinclair, what do you think about the transposon theory of aging? As cells get older, transposon becomes looser, dis disrupting normal cell function. Is this the epigenetic change that you also describe as the information theory of aging? 
Um, what, what do transposons have to do with uh, cellular function in this case? Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot. And uh, I do talk about it in my book, uh, which is uh, a good thing. So my short answer, you can always read more. Um, I, I love it. Uh, it's, it's a very important component of my theory. And uh, so John Sedevy and Vera Glovenova and Steve Helfand deserve a lot of cre credit for recently showing, in, at least in animals and, and possibly in people, that the emergence of retrotransposons, a lot of this repetitive DNA in the cell, um, drives some aspects of aging and possibly a lot of it. Uh, and in fact, the SIRT6 gene that we've been working on for many years and first worked on in yeast cells in the 1990s uh, is a major suppressor of, of retrotransposons during aging. And that if you delete the gene for SIRT6, those mice go through rapid aging uh, ostensibly because those hellhounds have been released from the genome. And uh, so it does fit into the th my theory of aging. The epigenetic theory of aging says that as, the, as epigenetic information is lost, in other words, the structure of the three-dimensional nucleus is lost, part of the problem is that genes come on when they shouldn't. And that's not just genes that specify vision and neuronal function. It also allows retrotransposons to be transcribed and multiply and leak out into the cytoplasm where they cause inflammation. Um, so it's a perfect part of uh, a perfect example of how the information theory of aging uh, includes and seems to explain um, many, if not all of the observations over the last uh, few decades in the field of aging. And we haven't talked about senescent cells. They're extremely important, of course, accumulating during uh, aging and possibly by deleting them, we can reverse some aspects of aging. Uh, in my theory, the ultimate um, endpoint of a loss of epigenetic information, the, you could say the accumulation of epigenetic noise and the loss of cellular identity in tissues is senescence. The cell will check out, stop dividing, and sit there as a senescent cell. So it could be that we need to use uh, fasting and exercise memetics, such as metformin, enamen, um, a wrapper log, for example, to slow down epigenetic changes. Um, then if they do eventually accumulate, we can delete those senescent cells with a senolytic. And then ultimately, what we want to be able to do is reprogram the body so that you don't get anywhere near that in the first place. Right, and it's a fascinating topic in, in itself, that. Um, okay, I think we've got time for one more. Um, Let's have a look. Okay, we've got Yuri, who's got his hand uh, in the air there. You want to go ahead, Yuri? Sure. Thank you, Steve. Thanks a lot. And uh, Dr. Sinclair, thank you so much for being uh, and available to, to the community to answer questions and have these kind of uh, conversations. So I think it's very important for us to, to have access to researchers and ask uh, pressing questions. Uh, I too have been uh, very excited about the uh, partial reprogramming epigenetic rejuvenation approach for a number of years. It's great to see it getting so much traction. Uh, of course, I think uh, the epigenetic uh, noise is a secondary uh, thing. It's mostly uh, epigenetic changes that are pre-programmed that our body is uh, just driving uh, to, to make us age. We view aging as an uh, adaptation, but that's beyond the point because I think uh, we both agree that it is partial reprogramming, uh, epigenetic reprogramming that can get us back to the kind of younger uh, epigenetic uh, settings of our bodies that will uh, help us become younger. And I think one of the challenges that, that I see is getting those uh, reprogramming factors into most cells of our body. And I think you've been doing work on AAVs. And so I just wanted to ask you if, if you're looking into research about uh, the delivery vehicles, or whether you, th you think AAV is enough, is good enough to deliver the, the factors into yeah. most of our cells. Right. So that's, that's well, the biggest yeah. question. Good, good question. So in our paper, we used uh, AAVs to deliver the Yamanaka factors into the eye of the mice. Um, and we've also used AAVs to deliver it uh, intravenously and infect the entire body of the mouse. Though the drawback with AAVs in our experiment and across the world uh, is that AAVs currently don't in equally infect tissues so that most AAV, uh, if you give it IV, will end up in the liver. 
and a lot less in muscle uh, and a lot less in brain. So the deficiency is in the technology right now. How do you deliver gene therapies um, throughout the body? And we, we don't have a good answer to that. I do know that uh, Roche has thousands of different AVs that they've manufactured that, that might solve this problem. Um, the good news is that for us to do a clinical trial and get a medicine on the market, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are, are already AAVs that work well in the eye. Spark Therapeutics uses them. Uh, Editas is, is doing trials. So we're gonna, um, we won't be adding technologies on top of technologies, technologies on top of technologies, because that, that ensures failure in a clinical trial, which is already hard enough to, to succeed. Um, but it'll be a, a great proof of principle to show that we can reverse aging in the eye. In glaucoma patients, uh, that's one of the first areas we'd like to go to. And then it, I think by the time we get there, uh, I'm optimistic that we'll have solved the delivery problem. Now, there are other ways to deliver genes. It could be a nanoparticle, it could be an RNA, it could be a DNA, uh, it could be a small molecule, it could be a hormone. We're working on many of those avenues in my lab. Uh, but the important thing is that the scientific, scientific principle appears to be correct. And the rest is just uh, is technology, which I'm sure we can solve. Awesome. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, so I think that'll conclude our Q&A uh, section. Um, we'll move on to the uh, five book free raffle. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Sinclair, for uh, you know giving us your time for the Q and A. Um, you're free to s stay on uh, and uh, I guess like uh, see the raffling process as well. Um, so the raffling process will typically what we're going to do is we, we, Josh has been writing down all the people who have joined the um, conference link. Um, assigned a random number to each of them from one to 100. 100 people who have attended so far. Uh, I will be using random number generator to go ahead and select randomly five people. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick screen share so you guys can see the random number generation. Uh, so just letting you guys know on screen share right now ahead of time. Let's see. I think this is it. Whoops. Can you guys see my screen now? Yes. Okay, so Josh, I will be giving it a go on the number generator. You can let me know who it belongs to. And then if they're still present, we'll go ahead and take their information for the, uh, to deliver the book to them, okay? All right. All right, so here we go. Generate 15. 15 BB7 Swiss. Do we still have a BB7 Swiss in this chat? I do not see that person here anymore. Okay, they lose out on a free signed book. Uh, these books are signed uh, with a personal note from Dr. Sinclair. Um, so I think it could be quite valuable. Number 43. 43 is KD. Is KD still here? Yes, I'm, I'm seeing a KD in the chat. KD, um, please let us know how to get in touch with you. You have won a book. Okay, we'll generate another one. 70. 70 is Tashi Hersmark. Tashi, you have won a book. Okay, same. Please get in touch with us. 15. We, are, we already hit 15. Oh, okay. Wow. What are, what are the chances? <laughs> 91. 91 is John Holleran. Do we have a John Holleran here? I am not seeing a John Ho Oh, John, you changed it into John. Okay, John H. Okay, um, we, we had a bit of a combination of names. Okay, John Holleran, you have won a book. Okay, next, 20. 20 is uh, A.V. Rosenbaum. A.V. Rosenbaum, you've won a book. Oh, I know Avi. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, and I think that's four. We have one more. We have one more left. OK. 
Okay. 89. 89, uh, D. Miller. Is D. Miller still here? Yes, I'm, I'm seeing a D. Miller. Yep, you have one a book. Okay, so those are five. We will go ahead and do one more in case we can't get in contact with all these people. This will be sort of like uh, backup. <laughs> okay. Uh, 79. 79 is Balaz. I don't know how to, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Balaz. Um, I saw him raising his hand actually there. Yes. Yeah, okay. So in Balaz, okay. The first five, we'll get in touch with Balaz and he will receive. Uh, free book in case we can't get a touch with all the first five selected. Sound good? Um, awesome. Okay, so I think that um, pretty much concludes um, our uh, webinar for today. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Sinclair uh, for giving us the time and answering all of the questions. I know you must be quite busy with all of the research and all of the book-related uh, events that uh, you must attend. Um, I guess just to finalize, I would like to just let everyone know that we put this together through Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, LEAF. Um, if you do wanna see more events like this, um, please do uh, help by donating to uh, lifespan.io uh, forward slash hero. Uh, you can do a recurring donation there, which really helps us to be able to put more events like this. Um, I will put the link on the chat to the side. This webinar recording will be available um, as a recording, uh, if you're part of our newsletter, um, you will receive a link to that. Uh, if not, feel free to subscribe to our newsletter and it will be available on our Facebook page as a Facebook live, uh, web, um, live video as well. Um, okay. So I think without further ado, that concludes this, unless there's anything else. Um, thanks everyone for coming and, uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. And if the winners can just drop us a line at info at lifespan.io. We will sort the rest out for you. And congratulations to everyone who won today. Fantastic. Great. Thanks for putting it together. Uh, we'll stick, uh, the organizer will stick here a little bit longer to maybe get in touch with some of the people who won the book raffle. Great. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.